Yeah, I, you know, Terry, just I want to uh, make a comment on, on the case you shared, you know, even I don't know the, the details about this case. I just talked to Stephen about your case and the way you draft the history is, is I, I really like it. It's like, it seems to really understand, you know, the framework very well, you know? And, um, and I think it's a very interesting case. Um, so, you know, today, I think probably the format just be very, uh, you know, casual, like we're gonna talk about the history and then we're gonna think about what's the next step, how to uh, handle this case. Great. Yeah. Oh, I have, have Chaya join us, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I haven't seen uh, Chaya, she's gonna be, I think, uh, commuting, but chime in if you can. Oh, you're you're in a building. Hi, Shaya. Hi, Ty. How are you? Good. good. How are you? Good. Good. I'm gonna be like running all over the place because like I literally just got home from work and I'm eating and making food, so I'm gonna yeah, go. No off worry. We just oh, actually just started. Yeah. I'm just saying uh, hi, but I'm gonna turn my video off and turn my yeah. mute off. <laughs> I'm just listening. I was supposed to be listening just on the phone, but I ended up. Long story. You don't need to know my story. Well, but if you have if you have questions, and I and I do want to talk to you more about your one um, comment that you made about the kind of like psychosocial questionnaires, and I uh -huh. do use them, um, and I need to be better about. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say yeah, that? Yeah, like, yeah, I do. And I use... We've had this conversation, right, mm -hmm. about Callan Van Dyken. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't use the whole battery because it's mm -hmm. just so much, but I do have, I use the central sensitization index, the depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. stress scale, and the pain um, catastrophization index. Yeah, you know which one's going to be the game changer for me? Is Those three. Uh, Fremantle. Really? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we're going to probably, Terry, you're going to just... Uh, you know, briefly just talk about the history. Sure. And then what I think I will do, I will just recap the, you know, the four horsemen, you know, and then probably everyone can pose a question and then we see where this case can go. What do you think? Sounds good. Okay. Um, so I don't know if everyone has read this. I'll just try to briefly go through, maybe not completely read this, but 51-year-old um, guy came into the clinic very nervous, very kind of upregulated. And he warned me that he was going to be, we emailed back and forth actually probably like five or six times before he even came in. Um, and very, um, very fit um, guy. Like you could tell his muscular goes to the gym every day, works out um, really, really um, has a good, understanding of like self-care and um, seems very um, aware of himself and it's, it's interesting. So um, he has basically a one, one to one and a half year history of increasing perineal pain, um, basically right at um, the base of the scrotum, like basically bulbo. I mean, it's really isolated. Um, it does refer down into his left testicle. It does also refer um, kind of into the mid shaft deep of the penis only after ejaculation. His pain got basically increasingly worse until the last two months it's kind of leveled off. Um, got cleared by urology, got cleared by his PCP. Basically his urologist said like, I can't help you with pain. Um, and he has his aggravating is mainly pressure sitting really bothers him. And then any arousal is painful. And then during ejaculation, it's painful. And then after also, he says he really ramps him up for days basically. Um, but he is dances around calling it pain. He calls it discomfort. Um, and then of course talks about erectile dysfunction that's related Although it sounds like he had had some 
struggles with that maybe kind of in the years leading up because he's been on testosterone for a few years. And he said that was one of the reasons why he started the testosterone. Um, so he's been a long-term married relationship. I didn't ask about kids, but I, he doesn't sound like he has any children in the home. But interesting to note that his wife seems super supportive of anything that like would relieve his stress. He has a pretty high stress job. He's a building contractor or, or a, a general contractor and has his own big business with a lot of a huge staff members and everything. Um, so his wife though, when I we started talking about sex and sexual practices, um, because he would, you know, start to tell me like anytime, like we have a date night or my wife will like start to say like, oh, you know, I want to, you know, get intimate tonight or this week or whatever, he would get so stressed out thinking about it and thinking about the upcoming pain um, that it would just really bother him. And so I started asking him more about, um, sorry, I don't, am I rambling already too much? I'm not being very succinct. Okay. Um, <laughs> so he, I started asking, you know, are you basically, are you only doing kind of, I started asking about positions and um, if they're only doing penetrative intercourse. And he said he didn't even think that his wife would necessarily like be interested in being pleasured in other ways, which I think, you know, <sighs> I think he he felt some frustration around that. And he basically told me that she was really, really conservative um, and that she actually didn't want him to come see me at all. And it took him some months to convince her to go and get some help. And um, so there's that. So he didn't have any history of, of penile injuries. Um, he did just start taking Cialis, which... I have questions, especially um, for Woody, about what that might do and how that might interact. Um, he did have a groin strain a few, like maybe a month or two before his symptoms started, but it sounded like it was in kind of a different area, but he basically slipped on something and did like a split. And then he had a lot of pain basically around um, adductor insertions on that left side, which is the side that he does tend to have more pain on. But I checked out his adductors, his hamstring. I did a pretty good MSK, his spine. I did a lot of repeated movement stuff in standing and laying. And I didn't have, it didn't seem like orthopedic hip groin. It didn't seem like spine. Um, and that was where I got kind of confused about this was it seemed, it didn't seem pelvic floor per se, because it was just one pelvic floor muscle. And it didn't also seem, I know there's a lot of psychosocial components, but it didn't necessarily seem like it was completely sensitization because it's again, so focal. So that's where I'm kind of getting confused and wondering if I am maybe like missing a red flag or, but I did all my red flag screening and yeah. So I'm just a, a bit confused. And in case I forget to say it later, thank you guys so much for coming and talking to me about this and helping me work through it. Oh my gosh. I know it's a long day for everyone and, and I appreciate it so much. No, don't worry about that. I, I like, I just told Steven, I think when I was there as a case, I'm so excited to discuss. I mean, I'm having fun, you know? <laughs> all right. I think, what I'm gonna do, I just, uh, let's share the screen because I want to share the framework with you guys. Can I, oh, I have a few things I forgot to mention. Oh yeah, go He ahead. does seem to have some bladder frequency, but he drinks a ton of water. Oh, okay. Like hundred and, I don't know, he had this huge thing with him. So then I start wondering about like, I thought the ure urologist would would ask him about upper urinary tract, like you know. But um, and they did offer him medications for OAB. Um, he had a very um distant history of left inguinal hernia repair, 
10 years ago and I checked that out and the scar seemed fine. Um, yep, and then basically everything else was kind of unremarkable. Oh, he did actually email me after this, another very long email that he also forgot to mention. He did have some reduced sensation, penile sensation, um, but really, again, a pretty uh, self-aware. He said he wonders if it's because he's so focused on the pain that he's not able to focus on other sensations and other pleasurable, so. Yeah. So uh, I just want to share the screen. Can you guys see the screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. OK, OK. I don't know if with your, yeah, OK. So uh, I mean, this is basically just a summary about the, the four horsemen, like we are talking about you know, how to classify the, the pelvic pain. Um, and what I want to probably go over quickly just you know in terms of the how the each category how they present and then we can discuss which one you know uh the classification you know fit well with this case so see when we have a you know pelvic pain case so this is the first line we represent you know our history taking so we do uh screen out all the right flags and then the next thing is we're gonna have this baseline. So this is a baseline specific for, you know, we can use you know, certain calendar. And the first P is just pain intensity and pain location. And the, the, the second P represent, you know, the patient perceived change. And the last one is I use a lot, which is the sex log. This is basically the baseline normally I use during my interview. And then here, Next time we're gonna do the happy male psychosocial screening. And then if I find there are some intimacy related issues, then we're gonna go through this pleasure sexuality screening. So this is my history taking, you know, from um, red flags, baseline, um, yellow flags, we can see that. And then some, you know, intimacy related. So then we're gonna, the next step, all, everything here is all about you know physical examination and how to classify the patient. So I'm gonna use some um, you know just maybe an example of arm pain. So for example, sometimes we have people coming in with a you know just the bicep pain, and just to clarify each category how they present, and then we're gonna try to fit that classification into our pelvic pain. So for example, if someone coming in with elbow pain just around the bicep. So the first thing we have to rule out is this pain coming from this, you know, bicep or is refer pain from the spine. And said so that's all about, you know, uh, rule out this, you know, the spinal referred pain. So that's the first category, which is means the pain present locally, but actually the cause is not, you know, the local issues, right? So this is a, the type of pain. So. The second one I will talk about, this is a pelvic floor uh, dysfunction. So this is how I explain that. It's more like, for example, someone came in with this bicep tendinitis, right? Tendinopathy, okay? But the pelvic floor, we never talk about that, but from my clinical experience, and it does exist, you know, that's the, the type of localized pain and typically in the insertion of the, the power floor to the bony structure, you know, uh, right behind the pubic bone, um, in the central perineal tendon and around the coccyx. And this, you know, this kind of pain tend to become chronic. And uh, sometimes when you examine the pelvic floor, you're not necessarily gonna see there is contraction or relaxation issues. And that's the same thing for we have bicep pain, right? The tendinopathy. They have this chronic pain only when you load the tendon to a certain amount of degree, they're gonna produce this pain. But they still present like, you know, mechanical pain. So they, they still have some, you know, typical uh, features, you know, which is the pain tend to be very localized 
and they don't change location. And it seems always there's a trigger and there will be some risk of factors. So the risk factors for this kind of issues, for example, maybe in this case, you know, uh, there's already, you know, in a uh, gr growing string, uh, a, a spring, uh, there's injury, uh, or either there's a past surgery in the same side, you know, sometimes we do uh, surgery in that region, you know, that's gonna form some scar tissues, right? So that can be a risk of factor. Um, and then another issue is like, um, anytime when we load the pelvic floor, and we know that the loading sometimes can accumulate. So uh, if the patient already do um, sometimes like a long sitting and then do some physical activity and then having sex, and it seems like that can add up the pain. Um, and another thing is sometimes, you know, for example, if I have a tendinopathy, like very localized pain, but sometimes I can have some muscle fatigue around that tendon. So the pain tend to be slightly something that can change the size, but eventually the pain will go back to that localized location. They don't change behavior. So that's sometimes um, can be a, a, I mean, a clue to fit into the pelvic floor dysfunction. And they don't spread outside of the pelvis. They don't present as a mechanical disorder, you know? Um, then if it's not this, this tool we can say they are more mechanical because ones respond rapidly with spinal repeated movement testing. And this is well con consistent re reproduce and responding to the pelvic floor loading strategies. And then we have this pain actually is driven by the dysfunction neural system. So you can see that Almost, you know, every patient coming in, they have these psychosocial factors. But we know that some so psychosocial factors is not necessarily the driver of the pain. They may be a responders. Yeah. So what is the typical presentation of this dysfunction neural system, like this kind of pain, if they are driven by the central nervous system? They're going to respond, did the pain going to be more widespread in pain because we know the central, they won't have a localized pain. And they tend to have some pain. We never find out a pattern. You know, they have no patterns, you know. They can, they can just lie down there, do nothing, and the pain just sometime coming up. And they will have some, you know, the whole central nervous system dysfunction presentation, for example, you know, uh, sleeping issues, memory issues, concentration issues, and they tend to have a lot of other pain disorders, IBS, migraine, TMJ issues. This is a good indicator. This is driven by the central nervous system because the pain change locations are everywhere. And the other dysfunction neural system is driven by the peripheral nerve, you know, that's fit into the neuropathy part. And the pain tend to be uh, neuropathic pain, you know, they have these burns, tingles, um, numbness, you know, and the pain can sometimes trigger by activity, but sometimes can be eased by activity, or sometimes we just, you know, sometimes they seem responding to mechanical loading, but uh, I shared a few cases in the past, they just don't respond the consistent way, you know, it seems that they are better the first day, or you think they are better, and if they are doing the same thing the second week, they say everything gets worse. So that's more towards to a dysfunctional nervous system. And then the last category is just tissue related. That means sometimes we have to acknowledge there are some uh, structural changes. You know, um, you know, we have so many surgical conditions. You know, for example, um, uh, varicoceles, inguinal hernia. Uh, perineal disease, microtrauma, all these things, they have a typical presentation. And you almost can link directly to their structural tissue changes. And so that is, I'm trying to fit almost all my patients into this four category. And, you know, uh, it's not always easy, but we, 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 like the reason why we do that, we have to really 
try to justify where we have to go because, you know, if we everyone we start from addressing psychosocial factors, we may miss the most, um, you know, mechanical presentation. So this is basically just like a map for me. And then from there, I can see all, oh, because everyone can have these psychosocial factors, but probably the first one, I'm gonna address a lot of their, you know, physical, and then I may address one or two, and they, they don't even mention that anymore, right? So, but this, you know, from central neural system dysfunction, this kind of driver's dice, I have to do a lot of psychosocial addressing, you know, and if this is more structural related, sometimes I really have to refer to urology to clear that up. If it's um, peripheral nerve, you know, I, I think they may have to need an injection, I have to refer to a physiatrist. Um, you know, if I cannot manage psychosocial factors, I need to refer psychologists or psych therapy. So this is just my map. When I, when I, I try to always put that in my mind when I handle patients and, and try to know where I'm going next step. This is beautiful. It's like the inside of your brain mapped out for us. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I wish mine was so organized. I, uh, can you, do you mind saying one more time what the CPPS baselines stand? Oh, okay. So this is the, the thing, how I'm going to decide where I'm going to go. Okay. So the C represent the calendar. So normally I can, after first visit, I'm going to send them a calendar, either urinary calendar or the pain calendar. So pain calendar, they have to mark what's the triggers of the pain. So this is the first C. This, the, the first P represent pain location and the pain intensity. So that's going to help me to know, um, I might make the right decision. And the third P is the patient perceived improvement. So I always use 30% as a cutoff. And the last S represent a sex law. That's the tools I use when I try to uh, decide, um, you know, my decision. I'm going to give you one example. For example, when the patient come back and when I check the pain log and I can see, oh, this patient, the pain triggered, let's say by prolonged sitting, prolonged driving. So I have some of that in my, in my mind. And then the pain intensity start to decrease. I'll say, you know, last week it was a six on 10. And then this week is about two on 10. So I know there are some changes. And also the pain location, if last week they say, oh, I have a pain in the tip of the penis, but right now the pain goes, you know, around my anus. So I know the pain location change. And then I got ask them, how much improvement do you think you made? Oh, they say, oh, only 10%. If they say 10%, I don't perceive as a good change. So probably I have to think about if either change my classification or either change my treatment. But if they say, oh, over 30, that's pretty clear I'm on the right track. And the last one is a sex log. I use that to see their arousal, their erectile dysfunction. I use that to see their sex position, their their sex preference. This is the CPBS baseline. Basically, I use the four of them, combination either one or two, and try to make my decision. How long do you usually give it before you do the perceived improvement questions? Like, I know it's different with everyone, but you know, how long do you usually give before you ask and like every treatment you expect 30% improvement or? Um, I think 30% in, I mean, between the, this, the, this, the, this, the treatment session, for example, if the first session, the second session, if there's 30% improvement, I'm pretty sure I'm on the right track. Gotcha. Okay. But if they only give me 5% and every time I would consider if I'm on the right track, okay. but, but, you know, they can see 5% slowly improvement. That's fit into the, you know, the tendinopathy part, because that's I always told them if you just make five, 10%, one week or two weeks, you're on, on the right track because the tendinopathy part, you won't get a quick responding. 
but you have a really low that tendon part. So I use that, but if, for example, they give me, oh, my improvement with pelvic floor treatment, like just within a week is 45, 50% improvement. I wouldn't consider they are the, the tendinopathy, that kind of presentation, because it won't change that quick. It's gonna be a very slow process. You know, I have a few cases and they, they, you really have to get them to buy in it because you have to really produce the pain they, you know, their presentation and tell them this is the treatment you're gonna get. And it's slightly painful, but it won't get worse. And it's gonna improve over a couple of weeks to month. So I, this is, did I answer your question about that? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I, I, I feel that way too, like especially if, you know, I basically, we, he's, he is set to come back in a few weeks. I wanted to give it a little bit of time, especially because he had this problem for so long. So basically what I gave him was um, some nervous system, like regulation exercises, some things that felt good and felt calming, which were some like deep, um, like deep supported squats, um, where he was unweighting his perineum. Um, and I also asked him if he wanted basically like a doctor's note to like take sex off the table with his wife. And he said, oh yeah, I like that because I think he wanted to like have a little break of, you know, and their frequency was only like, what was, I shouldn't say only was, was, um, you know, about like once a week or once every two weeks, something like that. Um, so, but basically said, you know, and then, and I did talk to him about, um, a counselor, possibly like sex therapy and also someone that can help him, with um, just like stress management in general, maybe cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and just, and he was open to it, you know, basically just for like supportive, um, you know, for his work stress and things like that. Um, but again, I just had wondered, <laughs> like I said, if I kind of picked the right thing, but basically after you went through this, it definitely seems like he fits more in the pelvic floor category. Um, and so I'm wondering if my, if I was making an assumption, because so often when I see people with pelvic floor issues, we can't, so often it's a lot of different things and it's not just like one muscle. Um, and I'll be honest, I, you know, men are 25% probably of my caseload, maybe even less. So, um, and I've been on hiatus, so I feel a little rusty, but, uh, <laughs> um, so maybe that was an assumption that, you know, if it was pelvic floor muscle or tendon or, you know, something MSK pelvic floor, that it would be more than just what I was finding. So, so this is really, um, really great. And I think he will actually probably really like the tendinopathy <laughs> example, because you can kind of wrap your head around that. Like, yeah. Um, uh, Steven, yeah. what do you think about this case? Yeah, Terry, I had a very similar case to this probably like three months ago. Um, similar kind of psychosocial background with a highly stressed patient history of pelvic floor dysfunction that kind of cleared up. Um, and initially, as I was going through the spinal screening, I had found some possible change or reduction in like perineal tension. Um, but the thing that happened was his like true baseline or functional baseline of you know, pain with ejaculation or a weakened ejaculation um, never changed. Um, so we kind of like plateaued. And so I got to that point where I wasn't seeing no like functional improvement. So I talked with Woody. And we talked a little bit about dynamic pelvic floor testing. And uh, what I think was happening was the patient would, let's say, have sex, ejaculate, 
um, and there would be a significant amount of loading uh, to the pelvic floor. And in, in my patient's case, um, he was um, uh, frequently masturbating, like long sessions, like holding back the masturbation, like the, the ejaculation, um, like kind of similar to like the jelking term. Right. And I asked him about jelking. He's, he's not, he said he's not even masturbating because it's, it's so it's, he yeah. has pain when he on arousal. So it's not, so that he tried so, and he's like, he can't, it's not, he doesn't like it. Yeah. And that's what happened to my patient. He stopped, he would go long three weeks without masturbating and then he would masturbate and then he would have pain. Mm. Um, and so what we think happened in his case was some sort of pelvic floor uh, tissue dysfunction that developed mm. um, maybe from re repetitive overuse. Um, and then we eventually had to reload his pelvic floor and it was really quite scary for him because everything produced pain to some degree. Um, and then we eventually progressed into the point where we worked up from very light pelvic floor loading strategies to pretty intense pelvic floor loading strategies. Like you're going to, you're going to practice your pelvic floor exercises while you're erect. Um, and you're going to build up to that position. Um, and, and we eventually got to that point. Um, and so now he's at the point where he's masturbating the full uh, climax, full ejaculation with, you know, 10% pain of, you know, of what he had. So that, that's kind of my experience with a similar case. Is, is that kind of what you were thinking, Woody? I, I, I think I, I have similar cases, you know, because sometimes I think because I'm, um, I'm, I'm so hesitant sometimes, you know, do a pelvic internal examination. You know, sometimes I, sometimes I just observe, try to see, is it contracting well or relax well? But the thing is, like I said, that's kind of a uh, pelvic floor tendinopathy case. Sometimes you have to do internal examination. So I have a similar case to uh, Tara's case is the pain this guy, you know, present as the deep pubic pain, you know, right behind the pubic bone. It's, if you look at the tendon, where that is insert that. And he will have some tenderness when we palpate the bubble spongiosis, especially when we put the resistance. So what I do, you know, I take the, so ask the patient, you know, this is the penis, they have to lift it. And I will use my fingers, pressure on the bubble spongiosis and ask him to contract. Actually, you have to put some resistance to resist the you know and that's really produce his pain um in that it's still in the same side you know the left side he always felt the 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 penile shaft pain on the left side the deep pubic pain and then i said you know this is probably what i'm gonna do so i'm gonna tell him you're gonna resist yourself contract the pelvic floor load that part with resistance with the finger compression on the bubble spongiosis. And it's improved a little bit, and then 30% probably better, and still the ejaculator pain doesn't change, you know, still painful, uh, basically just lighter pain. So then I, I apparent the loading strategy is not enough from outside. Uh, so then what I said, you know what, we have to go inside. So if you see the muscle contraction relaxation, the tone or whatever, it's just a normal muscle. You don't even expect that. So then what I did, I go inside on the left side. I really have to really load closer to the insertion of that part. I load, I told him, I said, you know, just fire me for once. I know it's going to be painful. And I produce the pain. I load probably about 10, 15 minutes. And I told him, so you go home and try to see what's, what's gonna happen. And then he said, you know what? You did so much and it's really painful, but you know what happened? The pain doesn't last. It's not getting worse at all. So that's a good indicator. This patient still within the mechanical, it doesn't seem like the neuro drip, like the, the, uh, the dysfunctional neural system. Otherwise the patient will flare, flare up completely. So that's really give me a good confidence. You know what? I so this is really the case. Okay. So I so have to do it. It didn't, it didn't necessarily get better, but it didn't get worse. Exactly. That's a, okay. you know, sometimes we really have to, to really low the pelvic floor very, very high. Uh, so that's why that that's after the exercise, what I gave is he has to get a full erection. During the erection, he has to contract that pelvic floor. 
in the pelvic loading position, which is in standing, that's probably load the pelvic floor the most. And he has to probably sometime rotate the pelvic floor into posterior tilt and to get the last degree of that, that high loading with masturbation erection. And that's really changed his case. And I think four or five weeks later, and that pain, 10% left. Can I just talk a second about how we're like told to like not load the pelvic floor when someone has pain. And I just love this because I think that you do sometimes have to load people to get them out of pain. Like when you get people stronger then like it's better. And there's this like, especially with the pelvic floor, like, oh, if there's pain, you just, you can't, you know, you have to downtrain, 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 you know, stretch, stretch, stretch. Like, so anyway, I just want to say (laughs) that's the case. Like, you know, you have to load a lot because a man, first of all, they have a sex. Sometimes the position is very demanding standing, you know, sometimes they, they sit on it and sorry about this, my dog. And then the pelvis have to, to rotate too. If you try it, you know, when we're in the posterior tube, you can try pelvic floor. That's a lot of loading to the tendon, to that part. And then you got a full erection, you got a full arousal. That's a, such amount of, a lot of loading to that part. We just give contraction in lying. Or it's really cannot produce that. And that's what I told him. We have to go try a strong loading to see if that make it worse or not. If it's make worse, we have we cannot go in. We have to do the relaxation, down training, you know, breathing, relaxation. That's if it gets worse. That means we have to go, you know, down regulate your neural system. But if it's not getting worse after with the loading, that means we have to go with strong loading. And that's what I told him. It's like, it's, you know, uh, because this guy is a is a baseball player. So, um, you know, uh, like I would say semi-professional, something like that. Very athletic guy. Like the pelvic floor, if you look at that, it's so strong, you know. But we have to get, find a way to load their pelvic floor, really get closer to what they have. So he has to masturbate every day and he will not go to ejaculate. So he will let the pain produce, not worse. Every day, 10, 15 minutes, standing position, pelvic tilt, contract the pelvic floor during sex, produce the pain, less than five. And with time, and then you will have to educate them. You're gonna feel painful and it won't get worse because remember last time we did in the clinic, we really tried to poke that and didn't get worse. Go for it. Mm. Woody, I think something important to recognize and for patients, I know my patient felt the same way. Um, we're not loading at like a hundred percent, which is like full ejaculation, which is like, what did we say? Like eight to 12, like maximal contractions. Is it, is that the number? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not that hard. Like we're, we're at a good uh, therapeutic threshold. So that's like what I told my patient. Cause we had to start like in, a, in very, very basic positions. Like um, we did a kneeling um, position for him that was like on chair. That was just like an easier position for him to start with. He could produce it no worse. Um, but it's still very much at where we started at least was still underneath what his maximal was, but it was still that like that five out of 10. And then now we, bi- then we built him up to um, the shooter exercises. <laughs> um, and, but it was like a stage-wise process to get there. It was like, you have to be able to load it in just standing or load it in quadruped or load it in kneeling. And then you have to be able to load it with the tilt. And then you have to be able to load it with movement and then load it with um, erection and then erection with movement. And then like, and then that's like the five weeks, at least for me, it was. And now I see him maybe like once a month. And now I have to, I have to like get creative because I'm like, how do I load this thing even more? Cause we need more load. Yeah. So at what point do you, that was, <laughs> can you write that all down for me? Um, like that <laughs> progression, um, like at what point do you bring in the arousal? It sounded like, um, Stephen, like you mentioned, it wasn't until 
later that you're doing bringing an arousal? Yeah, for, for me, it was a little bit later since he had a, a, a very low loading tolerance. Um, I think we brought it in after we did like dynamic pelvic floor loading with contraction and that wasn't producing any more pain. So it was like, I saw him, I think like two visits or it was like two or three visits because we were seeing like once a week, once every other week. And then it was, okay, are you having any more pain with those exercises? Is it producing any long-term pain? And he was like, no, um, they're easy. And then it was like, all right, well, are you still having pain with ejaculation? Yeah. So now we're like, we're easy here. He still has pain here. We got to bridge the gap. And then it was, well, the next step up would be, I'm, I'm doing dynamic loading. So like he's, you know, he's kneeling and then he's engaging tilting and then engaging the bulbo spongiosis muscle. Um, and then it was, I, I want you to try this. You are going to get 20 to 30% erect, you know, before you masturbate. Um, and what I want you to do is just while you start getting erect, I want you just to do the same exact exercises we were doing. That's how I, I did it with him. And then I was like, okay, how did those go? And it was a very like rote procedure. Um, but it was like very graduated progression. Mm. You know, I'm, thank you so much for all of that. Um, I'm going to have to sort through <laughs> figure that out. Um, you know, and I do think there's going to need to be some buy-in and doing some loading in the clinic, I think is definitely the good test of that. Um, but Woody, I'm glad you said that about the internal, because I did not do an internal exam. And I was like, I don't know if I should say that. I'm kind of like, um, <laughs> Because I did a really thorough assess, like all his posterior muscles seemed normal, like obturator internus, like externally, like all of that. He, you know, his tone assessment, I did SEMG, it was all fine. Contraction relaxation, like watching him, there was no delay in relaxation. Um, anyway, so, so I didn't do the internal because I just thought, you know, maybe I'll do it later if, you know, we have more time. And as it was, I have a 90 minute eval and he was there like an hour beyond. We were, it was two and a half hours. We ended up going, but, um, uh, I yeah, think so Tara, I do think you know, that would be good to do. I think Tara, like, you know, just one point to, I mean, like, I think there's one question you ask, why they're fitting to more pelvic floor? Or why the fit into more, you know, the nervous system driver. One thing is you got to find something either in the clinic or patient can produce the pain, and you're gonna really use that, you know, loading strategy to produce the pain. If they are, you know, power floor origin, they won't get worse. They're gonna feel the pain, but the second day they're gonna be probably gonna be the same. But the neural system that will cannot predict. They're gonna probably get worse or get better and there is no consistency. The consistency is to differentiate, is it like, you know, we call mechanical, you know, issues like pelvic floor dysfunction, tendinopathy, this kind of thing, or misuse, overuse, all compared to um, the dysfunctional neural system that just cannot be predicted. So much, so much things going on. And that can tell you where you're gonna address. So sometimes find a pain, you know, educate the patient. This is a, a key factor help us to know, is it your problem related to your nervous uh, stress relationship issues? Or either this will have to really reload your pelvic floor. And at one point the pelvic floor will can tolerate the activity and it's gonna be using like a tendinopathy, using as Achilles tendinopathy, tennis elbow to, to tell them that power flow can exist the same case. Mm. Woody, something I was thinking um, earlier too, and Shaya, you were mentioning this with your patient, one of his other chief complaints, which I think would be interesting on the sex log to track is his uh, erectile um, like percentage, like zero to hundred percent. Because something that I've noticed at least, and this was after we did the erectile dysfunction course, Woody, was that the mechanical ability of the pelvic floor to maintain first to relax, to allow the erection to happen, and then the ability for it to maintain the, the erection, because it has to kind of close off that, that function. I've noticed that at least with the mechanical patients that can't 
um, generate enough loading or force there that they do tend to have problems with erectile dysfunction. I don't know if you've seen the same, but that's kind of what I've seen after we took the erectile dysfunction course. Yeah, I think that's a very good comment. I do feel like when people have dysfunctional neural system, they're gonna have a mixed erectile dysfunction. They mean they cannot get arousal, they have arousal issues, and they cannot get a you know a reaction properly. They need a lot of stimulation. Um, this is more like you know they have dysfunctional neural system. But the thing is mechanically, for them people, let's say from spinal origin or either people have pelvic floor issues, they will manifest more. They're gonna get aroused. They have a good erection, and then they lose the erection quickly during movement or during sex. That means more towards to the mechanical component that are not working properly. It sounds like that is consistent with what he has told me. Um, and when you say more nervous system with difficulty getting any arousal, do you mean like peripheral nervous system? Can be both. For example, if we think about we have neuropathy, pusental neuropathy, yeah. they won't respond to, you know, um, manual stimulation, you know, they're going to have today, I'm going to try to just stimulate, doesn't, doesn't come up, you know. But if you have a lot of central driven neural system dysfunction, what's going to happen? They cannot even have a, they cannot, they don't even think about sex. Is there so much things occupied there? They don't even think about sex. They're going to have a, if you look at the erectile dysfunction, they're going to have a lot of called psychogenic issues. They watch porno, they don't get an erection, they don't have a fantasy. But if you peripheral neuropathy, that kind of thing, you know, pudental nerve issues, they can get erection by stimulation mentally, but then they say, oh, you know, but I don't feel it. Like I use my hand, I cannot maintain that because that's more indicate a sensory nerve thing when they masturbate. But if they can have a good erection whatsoever when they masturbate do everything, and then I soon they have partners like they move their pelvis, they lost it. And that means probably there's mechanical issues, either spinal, either pelvic floor. Okay. What do you think about the Cialis? Very good question. A lot of, actually their study I could show, actually Cialis shows like for this orgasm pain. I think their study, um, I, I forgot where I, uh, which year, quite recently, that the, the logic behind that, the doctor think about that because Cialis can, increase the circulation around the prostate. And then you know the cavernosis neural rest pass through and that can ease the pain. That's their assumption because they think if there's a pain link with arousal, what if I can, you know, improve the circulation localized, especially the prostate aligned. I think the the way that they prescribe that is like I have seen more and more common like a patient coming in, I already have low dose Cialis five milligrams for chronic pain because the doctor think about giving daily Cialis actually improve the circulation and maybe help the pain. But we know this won't work for people who have like, you know, central root driven. Oh, it won't work in a case if there is pelvic floor tendinopathy, this kind of dysfunction, it just won't work because you are not changing the loading at all. They may feel temporary better because they may have a better arousal. They don't have to keep them hard, work that hard to keep erection. Because the thing is, when people have this, they have, as soon as they have losing erection, what men they tend to do, oh, I'm gonna squeeze even harder to keep my erection. It's just like a vicious cycle. And the more they squeeze, the pelvic floor try to keep their erection, the more loading they get, the more painful, and then just like, you know, there is this inhibition from pudendal mm -hmm. nerve with cavernosis nerve because they communicate, the more pain you feel, the less blood flow you're gonna get there, you're gonna have poor erection. So it's like a vicious cycle. People have this, oh, I get a poor erection, I get squeezed even harder, but that won't work. Hmm. Woody, also, since we're on the drug conversation, I know you mentioned in the erectile dysfunction course how a lot of times testosterone is prescribed to increase erections, but that's not even in the erectile 
um, pathway. Yeah. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think like, you know, um, like, first of all, it's very clear. There's study I have shown, you know, there's many, many studies shows actually erectile dysfunction. If that's the only presentation, even patient have low testosterone, that's not the indicator for, you know, hormone replacement that just not doesn't work. Um, and because if you look at the whole pathway, yes, I think testosterone affect, low testosterone affect um, erection, but only probably just a partial from the central pathway, which is the psychogenic. Because that's where, you know, if you look at how the initiation about, um, you know, the pathway testosterone, dopamine, you know, all this hormone, there's interaction between that. But I do not think testosterone plays, you know, a significant in the erection because I have so many patients that have low testosterone coming, they have perfect erection. Hmm. And people that adapt very well. I have a patient come in, they have, they don't say, oh, my doctor told me I need to, I don't, I don't have any symptoms. I don't have fatigue. I check online. I don't have erectile dysfunction. I'm enjoying my sex. I am working perfectly. I don't want to do the replacement. So is that a, that's a comment, Stephen, like, did I, but yeah. yeah, I think so. Because I think you mentioned that the pathway is more so related to the creation of nitric oxide within the body. Oh, yeah. For, for erection versus um, testosterone, that it doesn't have the direct connection. That's why Cialis tends to work if someone's having issues with increasing blood flow. But the yeah. natural production within the body of producing its own nitric oxide is what might be the goal. Exactly. Exactly. Wow, time flies. <laughs> <laughs> We're well, almost one hour. I had a feeling that was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like I really, when he comes back, I need to kind of go a different way from where I was going. Maybe it wasn't terrible to start him with calm things down phase, calm things down, build, what is it? Greg Lehman, calm shit down, build it up. Um, <laughs> but Jaya, uh, Terry, that's exactly what I did I like I was lost so I was I was doing the same thing and um I think it was helpful though it wasn't lost time because um he learned just a good awareness of what was a good contracted state and a good relaxed state and then we were able to build off of that so I I, I was in the same boat too thanks um so I need to maybe figure out, do this test of some strong loading in the clinic to see how he responds. Is that an animal? <laughs> That's my dog. <laughs> Hi. Oh, you have more than one. You feel bored. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do maybe some strong loading testing, see how he responds to that. And if it doesn't, flare up his pain any more than normal like it might he might have this his normal amount of pain but if it's um that at baseline then that's probably okay to kind of continue and then at that point I would um start with some loading at a therapeutic threshold maybe with some like kneeling quadruped maybe just pelvic floor contractions without arousal does that sound like maybe a good place to start Oh yeah, I I think that you can you can start any point from like just like uh, with arousal, without arousal, with masturbation, no masturbation, any position, and with pelvic tilt, static tilt, uh, with dynamic tilting, with pelvic floor contraction, uh, the slow contraction, the the strong contraction. But your goal is to have fun something can produce his pain. That's really the goal, and the low grade pain that's really the that's really how we tolerate that's exactly how we treat tendinopathy right yeah and sometimes you have to do if you really don't know if you really think about localized pain mechanical things you cannot really produce well get inside and really load that part and tell him you know it may feel you may cause him more pain but that's really the treat you know the key factors we're going to load 10, 15 minutes in the clinic, 
and let him go back and do a follow up what's going to happen. Okay. And then of course, if he does flare up crazy, then maybe I kind of go down the, yeah. the down training yeah. Yeah. psychosocial road. Yeah. Because like, you know, think about how we low tendy, right? So you're going to do the contraction resistant, right? You can do inside and outside at the same time. That means one finger outside in the bubble spondriosis, one finger inside in that sling, and double double resistant, one compression, one load. That's a strong loading, right? Mm. So finger gonna be this. This finger goes in. I'm not just compressing. Okay, so this finger goes in. Yeah. Close to the tendon. Mm -hmm. This hand, this parallel finger on the bubble spongiosis. Oh, okay. And I'm gonna one finger this way, one finger this way with contraction. That's a lot of resistance. Okay. And they hold it and they do like their like 10 sets, 10 reps of five seconds. Yeah, you can you can do a few like the palm practice. And normally that's what I do. Like you can do the palm like a three to four seconds, right? Mm -hmm. Three to four seconds three to four seconds. And they, they can do that, you know, they get the erection at home because you cannot get the erection in a clinic, get them, get the erection at home. And then they're going to do the same thing. They put one, two fingers, this direction, compression on it because the, the pin is there, that's strong. And then they have to squeeze three or four and produce a little bit of pain, ease the pain, produce a pain, ease the pain. When the penis goes soft, keep doing that, you know, stimulate, Go back, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax, and then stimulation. So you you kind of like you know um, try to tell them this is what's happening during sex with your partner. You have to try to do that, like tell them this is how you go back to the game, right? So it's like a drill, right? Are we gonna learn this in the course? Because I have like zero idea of anything that you're saying. We we're going to learn that from the course. Yes, of course. Okay, good. So <laughs> yeah. I'm so lost. <laughs> like I oh, spaced out for one second and I'm like, okay, I don't know what he's talking about anymore. And then, Jaya, <laughs> then he'll talk about the pelvic floor Kama Sutra as well. Oh, okay. yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm hearing words and I'm like kind of not taking notes. So, so which one are, which course are you talking about? Is this the Montreal? Yeah, yeah. the one that's like, yeah. yeah. Cool. Wish I Terry, we should host one in Georgia. Yeah, I, North Carolina or North Carolina, we would get enough in North, but Atlanta is just a three hour drive. Atlanta would be, mm. would be great. Yeah. 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 We're going to talk about how the dynamic testing, all these loading strategies in the class. Yeah. Okay. When is it again? It's, uh, we have a February in Montreal. <laughs> um, and I think we have, uh, at the beginning of May, we have a Minnesota, and then we have a Chicago on September. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's sense. the that's the courses where they scheduled. But I mean, Terry, if you one sec, you're not going to New York in the end in uh, like May or June. The New York one, right now we have no sponsors. Like it seems like there's a group of mm -hmm. uh, uh, clinicians that are interested, especially I think they are they cannot take the course. I think uh, they are they are Jewish. Yeah, that's what uh, you told me. You said I yeah, should join the Jewish but, group. Uh, but so far, we get we didn't get, you know, we didn't hear back, you know, from them yet. Okay. Yeah, because mm -hmm. we need. Anyone uh, has any connects? <laughs> uh, that's because we need a prop like a, around uh, twelve people to host a course. Mm -hmm. It just so you know, we we'll have to fly in and everything. So, did you ever connect with Tracy Share? Oh yeah, yeah. We we recently oh, we recently co connected. Yeah, good. and I'm excited. Yes, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah, I hosted Woody's course. Um, when did we host it, Woody? I think September 24th, if I'm right. Yeah, it was it was really good. Um, I we had a a good group of clinicians from Shirley Ryan. Um, and then we had a couple clinicians from over the states um but it, it was it was good um we took a lot out of it we had the live male models which was fun they were awesome yeah um, 
So how do you find though? How do you find the alignment model? I, I was I was tasked with finding the male models. So I uh, made a Craigslist ad. <laughs> and oh, they were uh, amazing. Yeah. And we, we yeah. I thought I was gonna have no one respond. I think I started like two to three weeks before, right? The course. And I probably had over 50 responses on Craigslist. Now I'm telling you, you're weeding through like crazy responses. And then we had like professional male models that do like medical modeling for universities respond. Uh, they were awesome. Like we had two guys, one guy like travels around and does this as like his side gig. And he's like, oh yeah, I saw this course. He's like, I thought this would be really fun. <laughs> he was great. You know what happened? He just, I think he emailed us like not, not long ago, about a month ago. He said, I'm going to be there in Montreal for your course. I said, what? <laughs> oh, that is so funny. That's so funny, yeah. yeah. Wait, Woody, is he really going to be there? I'm not sure. I will see. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get my patients with pain to come in instead of these models? Oh, but I you mean, I don't know. <laughs> you can, if your patient's interested, but probably it won't be a good idea because we're going to have four people to do the same technique on some model. You oh, know? so you don't want people with pain. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That, that would be interesting though, Woody, if we did like, if we did have a host facility that had a patient on the last day and we had time, but it would be really <laughs> for time. I, I think that's eventually, that's the really the goal. I, I really think through the best we can learn is actually through the real patient and the real case. Like all this kind of discussion, like, you know, Tara, when I, I told that, I told uh, Stephen before you joined us, I said, oh my God, she write the case exactly. That's the key information. You know, I, I think even you didn't take the course, but the way you write it is, is oh, very clear. You know? Thank you. And I... that's really helped me to, to prepare my response. But because sometimes I see a case on the internet, I just don't know because there's no information I need. There's so much information I, I am missing. I don't know how, where I'm gonna respond. Sometimes my 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 colleague will always tag my name on the case. I say, oh my God, I don't know how I'm gonna even start. Like there's probably 90% of the information I'm missing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wasn't sure when I was doing it. I was like, is this too much? What am I? But I was like, you know what? Even if no one comments on this, this is good for me to, because that's different than how I write my eval notes. Um, so I found the process actually really helpful even just to write out the post like that. Um, and that's yeah. what I think Stephen would talk about, you know, maybe we're gonna host this format like once per month and anyone can post a case. And I think it's really worth to, to talk this way. You know, only, only through the case we can, because even I present the cases in the class, I, you know, like I think Stephen, we, we, I present like I think 20 cases something in the Chicago, but in the Montreal case right now, I, I, I have 36 cases in my, in my checklist I want to talk about, but uh, it's only when you have this case and you have this experience and I can, like the case, when you, when you write that way, I immediately link with my patient and Stephen, he, he has a similar patient and that's how we're gonna figure out what's the best way. I don't think the way of my management is the best way, but just by listening to everyone and you're gonna get the ideas, how to load them, you know? It's like, you've been at work all day, play with me now. <laughs> yeah, I know, this is, he's right now, you know, a, you know, a teenager, look, look at that. It's like, it's so annoying, just keep bugging me, you know, the whole hour. <laughs> I have to hide this because otherwise he's gonna make a lot of noise. <laughs> Funny. Okay, well, I oh, will try great. to post really an update. To... This was really, really helpful. I, I feel like I've wrapped my head around it so much better. And, and I think that it will also be helpful to have him feel my confidence and feel like, okay, there's a plan, you know, and just I think having that reassurance um, yeah. does so much wonders for people when they're having problems and have nowhere no idea who to turn to or what to do so yeah thank you guys so thank much you. yeah thanks Tara. thanks for sharing yeah thanks again thank you sorry all right, bye. Thanks, bye. Bye. Good to see you. Yeah. All right. okay bye. bye guys bye okay good night <laughs>